<coughs> Thanks very much, Simon. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yeah. Very good. OK. Uh, just before I start, for those of you who are wondering uh, who's the weird guy with a flip-flop and a shoe on at the front, uh, th this is not some bizarre fashion statement by a headmaster trying to curry favour with a bunch of students. Um, I have a, a blister on the back of my heel. OK. <laughs> First, to, uh, to, to set the scene, what is an international school? Who are we? What are we attempting to achieve? Um, international schools were started just after the First World War in and around Geneva uh, because of the rise of the League of Nations and the increasing uh, mobility required by international families as they travel for work or for business reasons around the globe. Uh, many people didn't want to leave their kids in boarding school. They'd like to take them with them uh, to keep uh, their families together. Uh, and that's increased over the years. There's a, an increasing number of people now uh, who aren't just in the diplomatic sections, but also through business and industry, who want to keep their kids with them and want to travel around the world for work. Of course, there's different types of international schools. There's American-based curriculum schools, there's British-based curriculum schools, and there's truly international curriculum schools. Um, and the idea is that we offer an educational program to uh, a multitude of different nationalities. In our school here in Zugen Lucerne, we have around 56 different nationalities. Uh, and we employ around 170 teachers, again from around 14 different countries throughout the world. I'll get to why I'm telling you this in a second. Um, the idea is that we cater to these kids who go through our school system uh, and are largely known as third culture kids. Now, for those of you who haven't heard the term before, they're basically those kids where you wander around the corridor in our school where and you say, hi, where are you from? And they'll say, oh, I don't know. So you, <laughs> Do you mean where my mum's from, where my dad's from, where my passports are from, where I've lived the longest, or which football team I support? They have no clear sense of identity in the same way that many of us were brought up, uh, and in the same way as many of us acquired an identity from the nation uh, which gave us our birthplace or from the parents who gave birth to us. Um, and so we have to provide them with a sense of belonging, a sense of roots, a sense of who they are and what their goals and mission are in life to some extent. And so we go beyond the roles of a traditionally established school by providing what we might call an education program, and I'll challenge that, and that's the purpose behind this talk. Uh, and we give them something to think about in terms of how they can socially integrate, how can they make friends. Uh, they've often been ripped up from where they lived and taken away from a culture that they knew and understood, a language they loved, uh, friends and family who they got used to for years, and mum or dad's employment has moved them to somewhere in the world, and they don't want to be there. Uh, and so the first thing that we need to look to do is to provide them with opportunities to socialise, to make friends, to enjoy being in the place where they're at, and then think about where they're going to next in terms of an education and their aspirations in life. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because it kind of sets the scene. It means that we get to understand education from a variety of different perspectives. In our school, we have teachers from uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, Britain, Ireland, uh, Belgium, Holland, uh, all, all over the world, with a variety of different experiences. That means we don't necessarily need to approach education from one specific point of view or one national bias. We get to cherry pick, if you like, uh, from among the best in the world and say, hey, this could be really useful for us, and they're doing some great things in Canada at the moment in the pastoral sense. They're doing some wonderful things in America at the moment in the curriculum sense. Hey, look at what the British are doing after school in terms of sports and activities. And we can bring all of those things to the table and hopefully create something that's really exciting. And that gives us a unique, I think, perspective on what education could be and should be in the future. And what are those things which are key and pivotal to making it happen effectively for our kids and for generations to come. And one of those things is parenting. So, you don't need any qualifications to become a parent, do you? We spend so much time at school on sex education, teaching our kids how to do it or how not to do it. Uh, we spend so much money in society on contraception and preventing it from happening, that once it's happened, how much time and effort do we put in telling people how to do it properly? Think about that. How many classes did you go to about how to be a good parent? How many times did you read something about what I'm going to need to know as a parent? How many times did you get someone to talk to you about what are the key skills that I need to impart to my kids in life? And yet we plough all this money into stopping us from having kids. Well, get real, they're here. We need to do something about it. And of course we have a variety of expectations 
uh, and perspectives on an effective education and on what we want for our kids as they move forward. And that can be cultural, that can be personal, uh, that could be based on where you come from, that could be religious. All of our parents in our school have very, very different ideas about what their kids should be doing, involved in, what they have as aspirations for their kids and indeed what their kids have as aspirations for themselves. And so they're coming at this from their own angle and we're trying to help them. Yet understand that there's a huge multiplicity of angles that these people are arriving at from. I think it's important that we also understand something, the social context within which parenting is taking place in the modern era. And that's this. In our post-World War II era, there's a significant, I guess, lack of desire to be authoritative as parents. We misconstrue this context of being authoritative with authoritarian, and no one likes authoritarian. Think of uh, the, the Hitler image in the past, and think of the, the, the daddy state and everything we're told not to do, that all parents want to be their kids' friends. I'm going to give birth to a friend. <laughs> well, get real again. No, you're not. You're giving birth to a kid, OK? And it's your job to bring that kid in society and make them an informed human being and help give them an aim and a goal in society and help them contribute towards a society, not to give birth to a friend and someone who's going to love you for your entire life. That means you've got to draw the lines in the sand somewhere. That means you've got to say, this is what we expect, this is what we want you to do, and there's nothing bad about doing that, nothing bad at all. And I think our current culture celebrates youth. I mean, think of what's on TV, think of the images around you. And our current culture, and you've heard it before, and there's these people saying, you know, um, the kids of today don't respect their elders and they don't respect the generation. You can say, yeah, that quote comes from the 8th century, and indeed it does. Uh, and so this is nothing new. But the cultural and media perspective that we're bombarded with at the moment values youth over age. And we're continually, as a society, trying to make apologies to our children for who we are, or trying to think that we want them to think that we're hip and cool parents because we do the same kind of things as them, we like the same kind of music as them, we don't have to. We don't need to make apologies for who we are. We just need to be good parents. And I think there's a great quote here from, from a guy called Eric Sigman who wrote a book called The Spoiled Generation, which is how he describes children today. You know, for those of us who are hard of hearing, children have had a loud voice for a long time, but that voice is telling us what to do and in a fairly irreverent tone. So, Let's take on those responsibilities of being parents. I am one, so I'm not just lecturing at you. I'm thinking about this and reflecting on it myself as well. Okay, what else have I got to say? Community and spirituality. I think community is an important thing as we move forward. Many national systems have looked at education and have looked at the goals of education and have reflected on how we teach science better, how we teach English better, how we teach German better, but not spent enough time thinking why are we teaching science, English and German? What is the purpose of education? Is it about defining a body of content and knowledge, trying to help our kids become successful in acquiring it and then regurgitating it onto an exam paper in order to forget it in three years' time and move on to something completely different? Is that the aim of education? Well, if it's not, why are we doing it? So, in terms of education and community, is it not our role, is it not our goal to educate kids to become effective contributors into a global community? I'd like to reflect on what Vera was saying earlier. Unless we can educate our kids to accept some kind of global responsibility for the future of our planet, then what are we doing? Is that not more important than teaching kids how to do a quadratic equation or learning when the Battle of Hastings took place? I argue it is. Let's think about our community and our society all the way around the world. There's been a decline in the influence of religion and a rise in agnosticism. From where did we get our cultural values? From where did we get our ideas of right and wrong? Sure, we got them from our parents, but our parents and communities largely got it from religion. And if there's a decline in religion, where are our kids getting their values from at the moment and in the future? Well, what's the most powerful institution on the planet at the moment? The media. And what are they seeing in the media? Well, they're seeing he who has most wins, right? It's opulent consumerism. And our kids aspire to owning the fastest Porsche in the world and making the most money they possibly can. When you ask our kids, what do you want to do when they leave? They'll say, make money. Really? 
That's pretty sad. Is it not the job of education to talk to our kids about doing something special, doing something that makes a difference, contributing towards society in a different way, and making sure that they can be active participants in a global community that values the future of our planet and our race? What's the role of schools in all this? You know, we're, we're continually being told by people that we need to do better, we need to do more. I wouldn't disagree with that. We could do better and we could do more. But more of what? Do we need to do more science or more English or more maths? Or do we need to take time out and say, hey, you know what? Let's talk about what it means to be a human. Let's talk about what it means to contribute towards this planet. Let's talk about what it means to be part of a community. Let's talk about how we can work with others around us. And I'll get on to other people's goals for, for schools in, in a minute. The media is critical in this because it is the most powerful institution on our planet. Hey, look, we're now presenting to a video that's going to be posted on the internet and accessible for millions of people around the globe. Okay, it's, it's a key factor. And we're talking to an MTV McGeneration, right? Uh, these kids who all wear the same clothes, listen to the same music, doesn't matter where they're from on the planet, I can say we've got 56 different nationalities in our school. I can tell you, they'll listen to the same music, they'll listen, they'll wear the same clothes, they'll aspire to the same jobs, they've pretty much got the same social values, and that's not necessarily meaning we're an international school. Okay, we've got lots of different kids from different countries, but let's face it, many countries have the same values and the same ideas. And I think it's important to talk to our kids about what they aspire to be. What will make them happy? What does that mean? When we talk about spirituality, I'm not talking about comparative religions here and what it means to be a Buddhist and what it means to be a, a Catholic. I'm talking about what do you want to be in the future? What do you aspire to? How are you going to be happy? And give them a sense of worth and personal well-being. It's about being an informed human being who values others and feels valued by others. And I think that's incredibly important. How do we deliver that in schools? Thank you. How do we deliver that in schools? How do we work with kids to make them feel valued? And how do we just get them to enjoy learning for its own sake, have fun in learning, and become informed people? Because those are the skills that the community around us needs, the business community, the political community, our own communities. They want people to acquire these skills where they go on learning and become lifelong learners. So what does the future hold? Well, let's think about those aims of education. We've thought of them in the past, for so the past several hundred years, that if we pre-acquire or acquire a predetermined subject-specific skill set, then that's going to prefer us a degree of status in our society. Oh, yes, I'm a historian. I have a degree in history. Well, bully for me. That's great. What does that mean? It means I know a few dates and a few people. Does that mean I'm a more effective human being than anyone else? Maybe not. <laughs> we focus on the acquisition of the cognitive rather than the affective. We don't teach kids about emotional intelligence, yet it's critical. Do we teach kids how to empathise? Um, Dana talked about civilizations or organisations in Africa. How do we teach our kids, or how do we help them understand what it's like to live on the streets in South Africa with very little? And how do we teach them that we have a global commitment as a human race to be working together to try and solve some of these problems and difficulties? It's based around a traditional range of school subjects. We teach, as I said before, I'm sorry to state it again, uh, German, English, math, science, PE, technology. OK, they're all important. But what about social responsibility, economic participation, personal growth and development? Where does that all come into it? Aren't they core skills? Aren't they core things that we'd really like our kids to be developed in or developing uh, as they grow up? Schools can't be all things to all people. So someone's got to make a decision somewhere along the lines uh, about what we're supposed to be doing. And think about how far the role of schools extends into making up the shortfall in this community collapse. Where are the kids getting their values? You've seen them down the lake here, drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana, doing whatever they want. Okay? You've seen the disrespect towards a police force and authority figures in society. We're worried about that. Where do we make up that shortfall? How do we bring about a change? How do we work together as communities to give schools the power or to give other institutions the power to address some of these current failings in modern society. Because there are other things that are important too. Business demands are there and they're real. And I'll talk about some of those now. Because we're in 
what I would determine as an interregnum. It's probably not an appropriate venue to quote an Italian communist, but uh, Gramsci, <laughs> described, uh, Gramsci described an interregnum as a time when the old is dying but the new cannot yet be born. Uh, and I think that's exactly the time we're in now in terms of education. Because we've got so many demands on us. The demands of the, the business community in the 21st century. The business community they don't care if you know when the Battle of Hastings took place, quite frankly, unless you want to be a history teacher, right? Um, they want to know that you've got good community communication skills. They know that you can work in a team and with others of varying different abilities. People want to know that you have a willingness to take on responsibility. Correct me if I'm wrong, but these are core skills that the business community have identified that they would like to see in graduates from schools and universities. They want to know that you can creatively solve problems, that you can use innovative methods in order to address problems, global, local and uh, corporate. They want to know that people are coming in with can-do attitudes, with a positive outlook. Then we have the demands of higher education. This is where it falls flat. I'm sorry. But as schools, we're expected to get, and parents expect us, to get their kids into university. How do you get kids into university? You get them to sit tests in maths and science and English and German. And so, how can we on the one hand say, we believe in this new mission for schools, this is what our aim is, this is what we're attempting to do, and yet on the other hand say, well, we're going to dedicate enough time to actually get the maths, the German, the English and the language done. So, we have to make some decisions about what we value most as a community and as a society. The governments make demands on us. And let's not forget that they're saying, well, you've got to do uh, SATs, standardised achievement tests, to make sure that everyone's learning these subjects in exactly the right way, so we can benchmark students' achievements on these subjects about how they should be in English at that age level, how good in maths they should be at that age level. It's not what we should be evaluating. They're ever-changing the demands of governments. On the one hand, they say, the standards in schools aren't high enough. And then the standards in school go up because the results get better. And they say, well, that's because you've dummied down the curriculum. It's a no-win situation for schools. But anyway, demands of society. What do we need in society? We need society to be realistic. We need society. Uh, or society demands that our kids participate in a rational, reasoned way and become citizens within their communities who can contribute effectively and appropriately, listen compassionately to others around them, empathise with everybody in all different circumstances, and not tolerate, because tolerate implies an implicit dislike, but understand and appreciate that people have differences of opinion, and that they're all valid in one way or another. And that's what we need in society. We need kids to understand that we have to educate them for their own sake and that education is valuable because there should be a cultural appreciation. It's right that we value the culture we have around us, the art we have around us, uh, and that kids are knowledgeable about literature. It's important that they understand the global issues we have in the planet and the world around us. And that does imply a knowledge of geography and everything that goes with us. But I ask you again, how does all of that fit with a traditional subject model? I'm not sure it does. And we need to rethink it. We need to rethink education to fit the future. And that, I think, is something that the politicians need to do, the universities need to do, and then that can trickle down to the schools. Because until we get a mandate to do it as schools, all we're going to do is prepare them in the traditional way to sit the traditional exams so they can get into traditional universities and get into the jobs where they make the decisions based on tradition. And why? Because they were the ones who were successful going through that system in the first place. So why should they change it? So, I think education in the future needs to be more than that traditional bad of cultural and subject achievement. And it needs to help prepare our kids effectively for the future um, in so many more different ways. Thank you.